you have Bibles with you, please open them with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 73. Psalm 73. If you don't know where the Psalms are, just throw open your Bible. It'll likely land right there in the Psalms. They're right there in the middle, the largest book of the Bible, a collection of Israel's hymns and prayers and thanksgivings. Um, And I believe that what God has before us today is in sincere alignment with what Pastor has been uh, teaching us over the past couple weeks concerning big prayers. And I've heard it said that if, if the Lord's Prayer teaches us how to pray, then it's the Psalms that teach us what to pray. That we can never approach God and say, God, I don't know what to say to you because God gives us 150 scripts by which we might engage God's presence. And so the Psalms themselves, big prayers, that they draw us out beyond our own feeble attempts to speak to God, to think and to reflect upon things that are larger than ourselves. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great 20th century theologian, martyr under the Nazi regime, he calls the Psalms not just the prayer book of Israel, but the prayer book of Jesus Christ. That in the Psalms, we might might learn to pray not only with one another, but with Jesus himself. That as we speak these words, we overhear Christ praying them with us and on behalf of us. And as one who prayed the Psalms every day, Bonhoeffer says that our engagement with God should not be predicated on our own feeble words and feelings. The poverty of our own hearts, he says. But instead... Our prayer life with God should be anchored in the Psalms themselves, dictated by the richness of God's own word. And if you read the Psalms, they're quite honest, aren't they? Painfully honest. A lot more honest than perhaps our own prayer lives can be. Sometimes we talk to God like we're dating God, you know? We don't want to offend God. We don't want to put God off. We want to put on our best face for God. And the Psalms, it's kind of like they're married to God. You know what I mean? All the people who are married in the room know exactly what I'm talking about, that when a child gets sick in the middle of the night, there's no time for niceties. Let's go right now, all hands on deck. We've got to tend to this need within the house. There's an honesty there. And what's fascinating to me is that the most represented genre of Psalms in the book of Psalms is the prayers of pain and petition and lament, that upwards of 44%, some scholars estimate, of the Psalms are Psalms of prayer and pain. That says something, doesn't it? That if God in God's infinite wisdom is going to give us a prayer book, and God knows that 50% perhaps of those prayers are Psalms of pain, then God knows that at least perhaps half of our life with God needs that kind of radical honesty. For the psalmist, His pain is God's problem because God is somehow involved in it and that honest articulation allows for the healing of that pain. Psalm 73 is before us today and it deals with a special kind of pain, not just physical suffering or mental anguish, but doubt, the problem of doubt especially. And doubt is one of those things that perhaps each one of us deal with, but none of us ever vocalize, right? Because doubt seems to undermine the very faith that is necessary for engagement in God's family. We have this notion that doubt and belief are somehow mutually exclusive realities, that if I I either believe or I don't believe. We even divide the world in this way. There are the believers on the one hand and the non-believers on the other hand. But the scriptural witness is a bit more complicated than that. There's a story in Mark chapter 9 when Jesus makes his way down from the Mount of Transfiguration. And he's with three of his disciples, but the other nine have been left behind. And when he makes his way down, all the paparazzi flood to him like they normally do. And among them is a man whose son has been afflicted by a demon since his son was little. Leads him to have seizures, throw himself on the ground. And on the worst of days, the demons lead his son to throw him into the ocean to drown him or to throw him into the fire to burn him. So Jesus makes his way down and the man approaches Jesus and he says, teacher, I tried to get your disciples to cast out the demons, but they couldn't do it. And Jesus says, you unbelieving generation, how long must I put up with you? Don't you love mean Jesus, right? How long must I put up with you is what he says. And then he asks, how long has the child suffered? And the man tells him. And then he says, if you can do anything, please help. And Jesus quotes his words back to him. He says, if you can, all things are possible to the one who believes. And what does the man say? Immediately, Mark tells us, he says, oh, I believe, but help me with my 
unbelief. Simultaneous within his soul, the intermingling realities of doubt and faith together. Frederick Buechner, the great Christian author, says that if you are a Christian and you do not have doubts, you are either lying or you are asleep. He says, doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. <laughs> Isn't that odd, right? They irritate us and agitate us unto modes of faithfulness, but we often assume that these things aren't welcome in the body and welcome in the presence of God, and therefore we deny these realities, put on a pious face. But what if this morning, what if doubt is not the devil's playground? What if doubt instead is the potential seedbed of the Spirit? What if instead of running away from our doubts to find authentic faith, Psalm 73 leads us into them and through them and on the other side of them we find God's presence waiting for us. So we're just gonna walk through the psalm together. There's only two points to this morning's sermon. God has heard your prayers, right? So there's only, only two points, but we're just gonna walk through the psalm in its entirety from beginning to end. Let's start at the beginning, shall we? Psalm 73 found at the beginning of book three of the Psalms. There are five books to the Psalms right in the heart and it captures this dichotomy between doubt and faith in a beautiful way. Verse one, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Okay, so the psalmist is stating an orthodox claim of God's goodness to God's own people. The psalmist is a church kid. He grew up on the pews and he knows all the hymns and choruses and he won the Bible quiz contest and he could beat you in a sword drill. This guy knows the word of God. And so he states this firm faith commitment. God is good to God's people, Israel, and good to those who are pure in heart. But here, verse two, if verse one is the thesis, verse two is the antithesis or the antithesis. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant and I saw the prosperity of the wicked, the word prosperity in Hebrew doesn't just simply imply the financial success of the wicked, but instead it, it, it's the word shalom, their peace, that their entire world is put together. So the psalmist, God is good all the time, all the time God is good, and yet looks out upon the world and sees something radically different from that goodness. Have you felt these emotions in 2020? to read these headlines and to say, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good, amen, and yet at the same time, why? Why over a million dead across the world in a global pandemic, why? So the psalmist is going to say, yes, you are good, but as for me, God, I was this close to throwing in the towel. I was this close to giving up on you. Why? Because I look at the arrogant, the boastful, those in lofty places, and I see that their entire world is put together while mine is falling apart. Have you been there before? You know, you look at their Facebook feed, it looks like something out of a fashion magazine. The godless whoever in your lives, you know, they travel and they're eating at nice restaurants and they buy every gadget and everybody's healthy and there you are alone on a Saturday night eating a hungry man dinner watching reruns of Real of Fortune or something. You just feel radically alone, you know. Yeah, or, 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 or to put it more seriously, you are the faithful one, you're the generous one, you're the one who volunteers your time, you're the one who worships on a rainy Sunday morning in October, right? And you've been pleading with God for children that you might raise them as disciples of Jesus Christ and you're hearing nothing. And you look at it, them and God just seems to bless them with healthy child after healthy child after healthy child or your children are suffering while theirs are not or your career tanked because of this pandemic and theirs is thriving and you say God is good all the time, all the time God is good, but where is it here, God? The psalmist is honest. Let's see that honesty. Some more of it, verse four. For these wicked people, they have no pain. Their bodies are sound and sleek. They're not in trouble. 
as others are. They are not plagued like other people. Whatever translation you have for plagued, if you want to circle that word, underline it, star it, whatever that case may be, we'll come back to that word in just a moment. Verse six, therefore pride is their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. This is significant. It's not just that the wicked are thriving, but they're thriving at the expense of the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized. So it's a thriving that is a violent thriving and the psalmist won't have it and brings it to God's presence. Verse seven, their eyes swell out with fatness. It's an odd image used throughout the Psalms to imply indulgence, greed, hoarding of resources. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice in their hearts. Loftily, or in high places, they threaten oppression. The word for high places is often used to describe God's place. They have usurped God's place within the heavens and are casting down their curses upon the world. Verse nine, they set their mouths against heaven and their tongues range or walk or move over the entire earth. Circle heaven in your Bible, circle earth in your Bible. These words are going to come back here in just a moment. I cannot escape the wickedness and the violence and the oppression of these wicked individuals. The soundtrack of the psalmist's life is their scoffing. Verse 10, therefore the people turn and praise them and find no fault in them. So they're not just wicked, but they're popular. Sounds like our world a little bit, perhaps, right? Everybody is flocking to them to hear what they might have to say. And we finally get their speech in verse 11. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the most high? There's the atheism, there's the agnosticism. They are acting with impunity in God's world. Verse 12. Such are the wicked, or in Hebrew, behold the wicked ones. Always at ease, they increase in riches. So if that's the wicked, what does the psalmist himself say? Verse 13, all in vain I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and am punished every morning. So there's the word plagued again. They are spared of all difficulty, and yet I find nothing but plague, pain, suffering, burdens in my own experience. And I think this whole God project is for nothing. Has anyone ever been there before? Or perhaps you are there this morning. And the psalmist therefore shows us two points. I told you the first one is this, that my doubts are welcome in God's presence, that my doubts are welcome in God's presence, that the psalmist invites us into an honesty that we ourselves are unwilling to adopt. The psalmist, if we take these words on our lips and pray them with Jesus even, perhaps, that we are then led to confess the questions and the whys and the how longs and the when are you going to show up and what's going on with all of our hearts and God welcomes that catharsis. So uh, we have two kids. The first one is Kennedy. She's age eight. Uh, and then Judah is age five. You can tell I started studying the Old Testament between the two children, right? <laughs> Kennedy, very normal, modern name, Judah, one step away from Jedediah or something. So, um, so Judah, he's our mischievous one. He's also our, our spiritually sensitive one, but very emotional child. He's the one we have to intercede for a little more than the others. You know, parents understand. And so um, when he was three years old, he was eating lunch with my wife. And as you know, for every child, whatever meal they eat, it's always just a means to dessert, you know? And let's be honest, it's the same for us adults, right? <laughs> what's, what's the contract? How many bites of this do I need to eat before this thing's over so that I can have the cookie, you know? And so he doesn't eat, uh, he, on that particular afternoon, it's just my wife and him, and he decides that afternoon that he's not going to eat the lunch that she prepared. And so, of course, you do not get granted access into the holy of holies that is the cookie, you know? And so he is um, very upset about this, throws a tantrum, of course, and then once he's worn out, she puts him in bed for nap time and everything is settled and she goes to lay down down the hall to rest and wait for him to wake up. 
She assumes he's asleep, and about 15 minutes later, she hears the, the unmistakable crinkling of the Oreo package. You know, have you ever tried to sneak an Oreo in your house? It is impossible, right? It's impossible to sneak an Oreo. And so she hears that unmistakable crinkling, and she makes her way downstairs, and there is my son. He has shut himself in the pantry in the dark. And he, she opens the door, and he's got a cookie in his hand and chocolate all over his face, right? And she says, Judah, did you have dessert when you were not supposed to? And he looks at her and he says, no. <laughs> you know, like a liar. And so, <laughs> and so my wife, of course, punishes him and all of these kinds of things. And a good parent, not supposed to have that, etc. But there he stands, caught red-handed, and yet nevertheless tells her, no. So we kneel in our prayer closets And with all the faith that we can muster, we pray the needs that we're facing or the needs that our families and communities are facing and we mean them and God hears them and those are praiseworthy and true and good prayers. But deeper beneath those requests are questions and doubts and frustrations that God, are you even listening and there they are apparent on the surface of our souls and God, the knower of our hearts, sees them and says, I hear your prayers, but can we talk about the questions too? Ask me why. Ask me how long. I'm not disappointed in you. I'm not frustrated with you. You cannot heal your doubts without me. What is not confessed cannot be healed. I died that you might be honest with me. So ask the questions. Are you there? Are you willing? Are you listening? Are you even alive? And God says, now that it's in the light, I can heal it. My doubts are welcome in the presence of God. God is not interested in false piety. God is interested in my presence. As I make present my needs, so then God can heal them. Cheap faith comes from putting on a faith, putting on a face. True faith comes as we are honest about what is smeared all over our faces and in our hands. I was this close, God, to giving up. I'm this close. And then everything changes. Verse 15, if I had said, I'll keep talking this way, all my doubts, all my frustrations, all my questions, I would have been untrue to the circle of your children. This is the first time the psalmist is praying to God and not just talking about his sufferings. Your children. Verse 16, but when I thought about how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task, so I can't square 2020 with the doctrinal claim of God's goodness. Ah, verse 17, until what? I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end, the end of the wicked. Truly, you set the wicked in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. On awaking, you despise their phantoms. Nothing's changed about the psalmist's world, but what has happened? Where has he gone? Into the sanctuary. This is an odd form of this word. It's usually singular, but here it's plural. Into the sanctuaries, the holy places, which can imply, of course, the temple of God, or in this context, to step into a worship service like this, and on the tail end of a prayer or a sermon or a song, all of a sudden, the world makes sense again. What was black and white is now alive in living color. Have you experienced that before? The grace of God, but it doesn't have to happen in a room like this. God just ambushes us with grace in random and unexpected places, right? You get that surprising text message from a friend, the letter that arrives in the mail on that perfect moment, or you hear the song lyric for the 80th time and for whatever reason in your car on that day, there comes God's grace, or you're just walking the aisles of a grocery store on a Thursday afternoon and God ambushes you with a grace that 
reifies your world and brings it into a vibrant and living color. Have you been there before? Until I stepped into the sanctuary and then everything changed. So it's not just that my doubts are welcome in God's presence, but it's also point two, my doubts are settled in God's presence. My doubts are settled in God's presence. We often believe that it's our faith that gives rise to God's presence. Uh Uh-uh. It's God's presence that gives rise to our faith. So then, everything changes. Skipping down to verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. Who is holding whom? The gospel is not that you have the opportunity to take hold of God. The gospel is instead that you wake up to the reality that God has been holding you all along while you were unaware. God not just holds as in to kind of, you know, caress or something, but hold implies take hold of to seize, to grasp. God's got you and won't let you go. You can kick and you can scream and you can flail and God's not letting go of your right hand. That's good news, dear friends. You hold my right hand. Verse 24, you guide me with your counsel. So God sometimes has to drag us through God's counsel, but that's fine. He's got a hold of us, right? You guide me with your counsel and afterward you will receive me with honor or into glory. So no matter what's going on with the wicked and the problems of the world, my destination is the glory of God precisely because God's not letting go of me. Verse 25, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire other than you. Just a moment ago, what were the heavens and earth filled with? The scoffing and the boasting and the oppression of the wicked. But now, I don't need any of it. I just want you. You're more than enough. Verse 26, my flesh, my heart, they're likely going to fail, but God is the strength, the rock in Hebrew, the rock of my heart and my portion forever. So when I lack faith, God gives me the faith I need to cling to him back. Verse 27, indeed, those who are far from you will perish. You put an end to those who are false to you. But for me, it's good to be where? Near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, and now I get to tell of all your wonderful deeds. So here, we are brought into the reality that our our doubts are settled in God's presence, yes, but there is this moment that the psalmist now grabs back hold of God, I will make you my refuge, right? So now that God has taken hold of him, he can now take hold of God. There's a famous verse that we like to quote. In fact, it was quoted at the beginning of service from Ephesians chapter 2. And it says, By grace you have been saved through faith. And this faith is what? Not of yourselves, but it's a gift of God. So therefore, God knows that we ourselves lack faith. We are faithless. But God, according to 2 Timothy 1, is full of faith faith, faith full because God cannot deny himself. So whatever faith you and I have exercised in God for miracles small and large has already been given to us by the Spirit that we then return back to God. We have this horrific notion of God that God says, if you want the miracle, it's going to cost you 67 faith dollars, please. Well, God, I only have 31 Well, you better search the couch cushions of your soul and find a bit more, and then I'll be willing to act on your behalf. But it's never about the quantity of our faith, but instead of its quality. You only need faith the size of what? A mustard seed, and you don't have it. So God, 
has all the faith that you need. God gives you the faith as God shows up in God's presence. And then we have the joyous pleasure of returning that faith back to God. We're on Mount Carmel with Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baal. And many of us look more like the prophets of Baal than we look like Elijah. We will cause ourselves to bleed to get God to listen to us. Instead of following Elijah into the presence of God to build an altar there, a place to meet with God and to trust that I can wait here for just a moment and the fire will fall. If we lack faith, dear friends, we need only ask God who can richly supply it to us. It is not my faith that brings God in. It is God that gives rise to my faith. Your faith has been provided for by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what a joyful pleasure it is to exercise that faith back to God and to pour it out upon the feet of Jesus. That is the good news of the gospel. I don't know what miracle you're seeking. You're filled filled with questions this morning, but the Spirit of God is enough. You don't need to go scrounging through your soul to find a few extra dollars to appease a mean and angry deity. God is with you and that is enough. On the first Easter Sunday, after Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene, according to the Gospel of John, that evening, where are the disciples? Full of faith, preaching in the streets? No, afraid and locked in a house for fear of the Jews. And what does Jesus do? He moves past all our locked doors into the places we want no one else to see, and he shows up, and what's the first thing he says? Peace be with you. And then, He says, let me show you my hands and feet, right? Which is to say, it's me, but also is to say, everything that you are afraid of, I have taken into my own body and has been killed in me and overcome in my resurrection. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's been put to death in me. So the disciples are overjoyed, but there's one of them that's not among them. Who is that? Thomas, I don't know where he was, getting groceries that day or something. Thomas is not there. A man who is known for his doubting. So they tell him, hey, by the way, we saw Jesus. I'm not going to believe it until I see the nail-pierced hands and his side. Because Thomas has been disappointed one too many times. Thomas is a realist. Thomas understands that I'm not going to get my hopes up and see that this was all a figment of your imagination. But Thomas is there one week later. Jesus shows up again, what does he say? Thomas, you good for nothing disciple, how dare you doubt me? Uh Uh-uh, what does he say? Same thing he said the first time, peace be with you, including those who doubt. And he says, Thomas, come here, come here. I'm not mad at you. I'm not disappointed, I'm right here. It's me, it's me. Stop doubting and believe. Here, put your hand right here. Put it right in my side, it's right here, it's me. Stop doubting and believe. Jesus himself by his spirit walking up and down these aisles this morning, offering himself to you. Don't worry, you don't need faith, you just need me. And I'll give you the faith that you need, I'm right here. Stop doubting and believe. Put your hand right at the scars here, put them right in my side, I'm right here. My doubts are welcome in God's presence. My doubts are settled by God's presence. God's got you by the right hand and he's not letting go until he is with you in his glory forever more. Will you pray with me, please? Gracious God, we have such incomplete images of you. Images of anger, images of frustration, disappointment. We we assume that all you want from us is pious cliches or a faithful face. But God, lead us beyond 
the semblance of faith and to honesty. On behalf of all those hurting in the room, I ask how long, O Lord? I ask why? I ask where are you? I ask God that you would intervene and save and deliver. And I ask for each one of us that you would ambush us with grace in moments we least expect it. That as we seek you and cling to you, all the doubts and frustrations and questions would give way to simply beholding your glory as you guide us into yourself. We thank you for this good news. We thank you for your presence. We love you. In Jesus' name.